Uh, good afternoon, church. Uh, I like the way we are seated quietly, <laughs> expecting from the Lord. And that is what I, I pray for you, uh, that we'll expect from the Lord, not from the person standing here. I'm just a vessel of the Lord that he has sent with his word. Uh, we thank God for everything in the service up to this far. Um, I'm the last one in this series, Overflow series, and I was thinking of CATS, Continuous Assessment Tests. But I know some of you may, may not have some good memories with CATS. Yes, so I thought of summarizing what, we've been look, what we have looked at so far. The aim of this series has been to remind and encourage us about stewardship and giving to the Lord. Our senior pastor began us uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and uh, we were reminded that true giving starts when we surrender ourselves to God. Uh, and also recognizing that everything belongs to God and faithful stewards give proportionately. Uh, our next speaker, Mr. Fred Kinyua, I hope he's in the house, uh, took us through Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 to 11, and he reminded us of three things we need in order to grow in servanthood generosity, and in pleasing God. And those are looking at yourself carefully, uh, seeing others as you hurt, and looking at Jesus Christ. Last Sunday, we had uh, our elder and pastor, Leonard, take us through Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 to 30. And we saw... Uh, the example of looking at the interest of others and that of Christ is demonstrated uh, by the church of Philippi and the servants of God, uh, Paul, uh, Timothy, and Epaphroditus. Uh, these uh, servants of God overflowed with generosity in ministry to the flock. I was, I was going through that, that passage and I could see uh, a concern that like no other. No wonder Paul started one of the verses by saying uh, that this is like unusual, that others mind their own interest. But these ones, they were even willing to die for the sake of you. Uh, so when I was reflecting on what we have been going through in this series, I was just praying and asking God, is there, you do still have something for this uh, church on this series, now that we have heard all this? And you can see where I'm coming from after all this has been preached to us. Do you feel there is something that we still need to hear about giving, stewardship, this series? Yes, I have a text, uh, and even with this text, I was there. And I'm going to read the text for, for, for our uh, passage, or for our sermon this morning. It's in the book of Genesis, chapter 4, verse 1 to 7. And this is the first family. And I would say this is the true first family. Uh, this is what the Bible says. Adam knew his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. 
in the course of time, Cain brought some, uh, verse three, in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruit of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Habel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So that is our text for today. It is God's word. And I believe God is going to speak to us through that text. Uh, I want to share with us from that text uh, four Bible truths. Uh, four Bible truths uh, that I felt the, the Lord was impressing in my heart to share with you from that uh, passage. As I desire and pray that we will continue to grow in our understanding of God and that we will trust him to help us to be the kind of stewards that he wants us to be. I was listening to our first sermon uh, by our senior pastor about some of the ridiculous sermons you have heard about giving. And uh, I'm reminded of a group of pastors who uh, uh, met one time. And they observed that uh, giving in their churches had gone uh, uh, down. And they thought of uh, how can, can we help our members uh, to grow in their giving? How can we uh, improve uh, uh, in giving in our churches? And they resolved that they go and buy some aluminum trays so that as people are bringing their offertory or their giving in the front, uh, they are careful not to drop coins because if they drop coins, uh, it can be an embarrassment to them. So they, they have to prepare to bring some, some notes. And I'm not telling you a, a, a story. Something pastors and elders, when they met, uh, they decided. After some time, uh, when they met again, uh, they observed that uh, giving had not changed, except for one uh, of the churches. And they asked the pastor, it looked like the trick worked for you. And pastor was like, no. For me, when I reflected on that, I decided I will not go and do that. I chose to continue preaching the word of God or the counsel of God the way it is. And not just about giving, but also that my congregation can grow in the understanding and knowledge of God. And as a result, their love for God has grown and their love for the things of God has grown, and they are trusting God to help them to walk in obedience uh, to him. And that is my desire and my prayer. As believers get renewed and transformed in their hearts, worship will become a lifestyle in their lives. And worship is every aspect of their life, that they, they will grow, not just in one area, but in all areas as believers. And one of these areas is 
stewardship of all that God has in, entrusted uh, to them. And they can recognize that they are no longer uh, to live for themselves, but to live for Christ. If they reach that point, then there is nothing they can hold back. They will withhold nothing. And therefore, I want to share with us these uh, four biblical truths from this passage. And I believe this is the word of God that he laid in my heart, or he impressed in my heart. And the fa the, these four uh, uh, truths, uh, the first one is God is merciful and graciously gives us. That is verse 2, verse 1 and 2. The second one is that God blesses the works of our hands. Hence, we should remember him. Verse 2 to 3. And then the other one is that God looks at the heart of the giver. Verse 4 to 5. And the last one is that God calls our attention about the state of our heart. God calls for our attention about the state of our heart. Verse 6 to 7. And therefore, I believe uh, I'll not be, I will not take long. I don't have somebody to raise their hand if I, if I go beyond the time, but I, I trust God will speak to us. God is merciful and graciously gives us. Verse 1 and 2, the Bible says, uh, Adam knew his wife Eve. And she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Uh, this is the first family, and this is uh, early in the beginning. Immediately or almost immediately after the fall of man. We are not told how long it had taken since uh, uh, Adam and Eve sinned and they were uh, banished from the Garden of Eden. But that is the context in which uh, this uh, passage is written. Uh, Adam and Eve, they had just received uh, their consequences or the consequences for their sin. God had just pronounced uh, to them uh, uh, the consequences of their sin. And we realize now it is in that context now uh, uh, Eve is, is, is acknowledging uh, by God by, by using these words in verse, in verse 1. With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. What we see here about God is that he's a gracious God, he's a merciful God. These people whom he had created, they, they sinned against him, but he did not abandon them completely. And we see this beginning from chapter 3. Uh, even after they had sinned, God went ahead and clothed them. And that is the picture we are seeing of our God that is merciful and is gracious. And he realized this when she, she got uh, the first child. She confessed that it is through the help of the Lord that I have this man. Or oh, God has helped me to bring forth this man. Yes, it's true from the consequences of sin that he had gone through the sorrow 
of, 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 of giving birth. But she did not lose the, the sense of God's mercy uh, in her pain. And as I was thinking about this and our gracious God and us today, uh, I would say that even today, there are times when we go through tough times, difficult times in this world, which is, which is the fallen world. This is not the perfect world. There are times we go through uh, times when we even ask questions. Uh, is God still there? Did God create the world and then he went away? Especially when we go through tough times. But I want to share with us this morning and remind you that even when you go through those times, you should never lose the sense that God is still merciful and is gracious. And he does not change. And we see this in this passage. That even after these people had sinned against him, he's still showing them his mercy and is gracious to them. Yes, God has to punish sin because he's just, but he does so in grace and in mercy. And that is what he has shown us. Uh, having children was not uh, as a result of the curse. When God created Adam and Eve, he told them to go and multiply in verse 1. So this wasn't as a result of the curse. And still God went ahead. God went ahead and blessed them. We see him here portrayed uh, as a gracious and merciful God. And this, is, this understanding of our God as merciful and gracious, as we think about generosity, should cause us to, be, to walk in humility, knowing that all that we have, who we are, is because of God's mercy and his grace. If God were, were, were to look at us, maybe there is nothing he would say uh, we are good at. It's only because of his mercy. And therefore, it calls us or it requires of us to also walk in this humility. As the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, For by the grace given uh, me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each one of you. So when we look at God's mercy and grace, we look at ourselves and get reminded that we are to walk in humility because Without God's grace and mercy, which he has shown us, then we would not be where we are. We would not uh, be the kind of people that we are in him. Adam and Eve, if it were not for God's grace and mercy, they would not acknowledge like the way Eve did. With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. And that is the humility God is calling us. Uh, us uh, to, to walk in today with the help of the Lord. As we think about generosity and giving to, uh, to God's work, we are to be reminded that it's not about us, but it is because of what God is doing in our lives. Uh, we are to see opportunities where God is leading us to serve and to walk with and support one another in our walk with the Lord. The second uh, truth that we see in this passage, uh, verse 2 to 3, is that God blesses the work of our hands, and we should remember him. We should not uh, forget God. In verse 2 and 3, uh, uh, the second part of, of, of verse 2, Now Habel, 
kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruit of the soil as an offering to the Lord. What we see here is that it is God's will from the beginning for all of us to have something to do. Work was not uh, after the fall. When God created uh, the first uh, people, Adam and Eve, he commanded them in chapter 2, verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So God desires that all of us work. That time, work was, was more of, of, I can say, farming. But with time, people have, have, uh, have come up with different trades. So we are not just limited to, to farming, but all of us eat from the farm. But it was God's idea from the beginning that people should work. And we see this immediately uh, going on with the first family. And what we realize is that God blessed the work of their hands. Uh, we see Cain worked the soil and, and, and Abel uh, was taking care of the flock. And what we realize is that they did not forget God even when he blessed the work of their hands. Uh, and, the, and God later reminded his people, the Israelites, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. After they have been blessed, after they have uh, received all this from the Lord, they were not to forget the Lord uh, their God. And we see this happening from the first family. We don't see uh, God speaking to them before this about uh, honoring him or coming before him to offer part of their produce. But we see this happening. Uh, perhaps it's because God had been speaking to them. Uh, their parents had uh, talked to them about God. And we see even in this context that God is speaking to them. Maybe that is how they understood about coming before the Lord with part of their produce. And as we think about uh, giving to God's work, one way uh, we remember God with how he has blessed us, with how he has blessed the works of our hands. Because God has promised in his word to bless the works of our hands. Whatever you do, it may be farming, it may be teaching, it may be uh, where you are in business or in some other uh, calling that God has called you to. He has told us he will bless the work of our hands. And one way we, we honor him and remember him is through realizing that he's the one who has blessed us. So when we give part of what we have or what God has blessed us with, we are remembering him. We are not forgetting him. And in this context, there might be an aspect of sacrifice and offering, especially in the case of Abel. Uh, but for us, when we give towards God's work and the needs of others, we are not making a sacrifice so that God can accept us. That is important for you to know. When you are giving towards God's work, when you are giving of your time, of your talent, of your resources, you are not giving so that God can accept you. You are giving because God has already accepted you in Christ Jesus. You are already accepted. If anything, God will not accept you because you have brought uh, anything or you have given of your time. It's only through Christ that we are accepted. So when you give, or when we give, when we serve, we are doing this uh, not to be accepted, but because we have already been accepted. And I was thinking, 
do we do offering? It's something I was thinking, and it's important for us to realize that. When we bring our givings before the Lord, we might have an idea of a sacrifice. You are sacrificing. I've sacrificed a lot. And I am just concerned. Is that the right, the, the, the right language? Sacrifices have, 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 a, have an idea of uh, doing it so that, uh, like those days, they'll do sacrifices so that they can be forgiven their sins. But that's not what we do today. We give because we are already in Christ and we give uh, and serve because we have already been accepted in Christ Jesus. The third truth is that God looks at the heart of the giver. God looks at the heart of the giver. And we see this in verse 4 and 5. But Abel also brought an offering. Fat portions from some of the first fruit, firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Habel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. When they came before the Lord, uh, God looked at, at them. The Bible says that, like for, for Abel, the Bible says that uh, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. There is a distinction here. God is looking at the person and is also looking at, the, at, the, at what they have brought. So we see here, God does not just look at the gift, but he's looking at the giver. God does not just look at the service or the ministry that you are doing, but he's looking at the servant. And now it's the servant's heart. They came before the Lord and brought each of them their offering. And as you can see, the offering or the offertory was, dif was different. For Cain, uh, it was different. He brought, uh, the Bible emphasizes that uh, Abel, uh, verse 4, the Bible says, Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. But when he talks about Cain, you realize that the Bible says uh, that uh, about Cain in verse 3, in the course of time, Cain brought some of the first fruit as an offering. You, you, you can notice uh, that there is a difference in the nature and also in the quality of how these uh, two young men uh, brought their, their, their offering before the Lord. There seems to be an emphasis on Abel's offering. Okay, the Bible does not say that Cain was also to bring an animal offering. That's, the Bible doesn't tell us that here. Because later we see that God still accepted grain offerings. So the emphasis here and the greatest difference, it is not uh, what they brought. Yes, there is an element that Abel seemed to have done a good job. Because when he talks about Cain, is, is to, if even some, some versions would put it differently about this fruit of the soil. But when you look at Abel, the Bible says that uh, uh, Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock, which is lacking in the, in, in the description of what Cain brought. But the greatest difference here is about faith. Abel had faith, 
Cain did not have faith. And this is commended of Abel in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel speaks even though he is dead. So God here is concerned not just about the, the work that we are doing for him, but about our hearts. There's this song the music team sang about, I bring you more than a song. For a song itself is not what you re require. You search deeper in my heart. The way things appear. And I felt that is the message for today. God is, is looking beyond what we can see. When Abel and Cain went before the Lord, no one else could tell if there is something wrong uh, with Cain. Maybe no one could tell. But God looked and he saw beyond what the others could see. The Bible when Samuel, when Saul came back from the battle and Samuel spoke to him, this is what God said. But Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams. And Psalm 51 verse 17 says, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. So when we think about serving God with our gifts, with our talents, with our resources, we need to look at this, that God is looking beyond all that. He wants to see our hearts. It should not be about the things we do for God, but the things we allow God to work through us by faith with our hearts surrendered to him in Christ Jesus. When we talk of generosity and being cheerful givers, it's not seen in the gift but it starts from the heart. Sometimes we can look and say, wow, this is a generous person. But God is like, I don't see that. It starts from the heart, which we can't see, unfortunately. But you can see, you, 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 you can have a snippet of that yourself because God will help you to see your heart. So how, even as we think about this and that God looks at our heart, we should aim for God to accept our worship, to accept our giving, our ministries, our service. That should be the aim of every Christian. That it will not be like Abel or like Cain, that, that, that God did not look at his offering with favor. I think that is very discouraging. Just it, it was here for, 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 for Cain, but the Lord speaks of him as having been evil and Abel as righteous. I don't think when Cain brought the offering, he became evil that time. God had noted about him even before he brought it. It is not the giving that made him evil, but it is his heart which God had, had seen. And for us today, I pray that it will be our desire that God will be honored. God will see, look at us with favor in our giving, in our service. That should be our desire. That God will say, well done, good and faithful servant. The apostle in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 to 10, he said, So we make it our goal to please him, 
whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due to us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. These brethren uh, made it their goal to please God, not men. It's easy to please men. But pleasing God, he looks at our heart. So it was their goal. They want to please him. Because one day, God will bring them to account. God will bring them to account. So the most important thing here is the heart. How we come before the Lord. That is the most important thing. How is your heart when you are serving, when you come before the Lord with your giving? How is your heart? We don't want to be that uh, group of people that God will say, these people honor me with their lips, with their actions, with their charity works, but their hearts are far from me. Matthew chapter 15, verse 8. We don't want to be there. You don't want to be there. That God would say, you honor him just outwardly, but our hearts are far from him. The last truth is that God calls for our attention about the state of our heart. Yes, God is gracious and merciful in gifting us. God blesses the work of our hands and we should remember him. God looks at the heart, but he does not stop there. When he looks at the heart, he speaks to us. In this verse, he spoke to Cain. The Bible says in verse 6, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do what is... But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. I'm not sure the tone uh, God uh, used to speak to Cain, uh, but I see God's heart of love. He has noted Cain's heart is not right, is evil, even after his response. Cain was looking to God as unfair, as his enemy, because he got angry and his face was downcast because God did not look at him with favor or his, 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 his giving, his offertory. But God spoke to him. And you can listen to the questions that God is asking him. Why are you angry? Like, do you have a reason to be angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? If if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. Uh, and here we see that sin needs to be dealt with since it affects our stewardship. If there is sin in our lives, if there is sin in your life, it will affect everything that you are doing. Because God is not working in your life. It is you who is working for yourself. And at the end of the day, you will not be very far from Cain's uh, attitude. So God is warning uh, Cain here that sin wants to take him way down. He's telling him if he's not careful, 
sin uh, will have him. And the way the Bible describes sin, sin has a characteristic of, of destroying. And the Bible says in, in James chapter 1, verse 14 and 16, but each one of you is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. God is, is warning Cain here that he needs to rule over sin because sin will have him. Sin is crouching at your door. It's only looking for a very small space, not for the whole door to be opened. And then it gets in slowly, slowly. And before it is too long, uh, Cain realized that he had killed his brother. So God is warning about sin. And sin will affect and can affect our ministry, our, 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 our talents, our, our serving the Lord can come uh, between us and God. And God is warning. And therefore we must guard our hearts by depending on God's power. I wish Cain had a better discussion with God. I'm not seeing God is like, Cain, you are doomed. I see God coming with love. And I was expecting like Cain would be like, God, help me. I can't do it by myself. And God wants us to have that attitude, to guard our hearts by depending on his power. Sin can, can have its way, but we need to guard our hearts. We need to put ourselves in a, in, 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 in a place of accountability, in our life groups, in our shuja groups, in our families, in our relationships as sisters and brothers in Christ. We need to be at that point where can we check on each other? Because God is sending the warning and calls our attention on the state of our heart. So as I conclude, I want to say this that, and it's like a question to you. Have you taken time to thank God for all that he has graciously given you? Your life, the people around you, your family, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, but most of all, the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. When is the last time you have taken time to thank him? Sometimes when things are easy, when life is going so well, we, we tend to focus so much on those things that are going on well. We forget the person who is making them go on well. The gracious, merciful giver. Have you allowed God to search your heart? And have you fully surrendered to him by faith? Even as we conclude this series of overflow, and as you look forward to what God is going to do in us and through us, have you surrendered to him? Because that is what pleases him. He doesn't want us to walk with pride that I have done this, that I am doing this. But he wants us to walk with that uh, thought of God is working in our lives. And sometimes I have this problem of appreciating one another Yes, it's good to appreciate one another. And the Bible is, it has a lot of thanking. But I see more of thanking God for. Even when Paul is writing, I thank God for you. He doesn't say, I thank you. He says, I thank God for you. 
And I believe that's a good place to start. I'm not saying we are not recognizing that God is working in us when we are thanking one another, but I'm just saying when we think carefully, we sometimes ask, our quest, ask questions. We prayed, we trusted God, but now we are thanking ourselves. I remember this reverend, I know now he has rested. People would clap in church. Then you would ask, come, when you are clapping, where were you clapping? Okay. So may we be reminded about this, that God is working in us, and he works through us, even as we, uh, we come to the end of this series. Uh, I, I want to stop there, and I pray... Uh, that God will continue to work in us, that we can grow in him, in his word, loving him, surrendering to him, and knowing that we are in Christ, and it is Christ who is working in our lives. And all that we have and belongs to us, it is only because of him and through him. Let's pray. God, we come before you with thanksgiving because of your word. Thank you, Lord, for enabling me to uh, pass your word to, to us this, this afternoon. Lord, we are reminded of who you are and your desire for us. And that, Lord, you desire to work in us and through us. Lord, may you help us even as we come through or, or to the end of, of, of this series where we have been looking at uh, how we can be good stewards of, of that which you have entrusted to us. And Lord, it is our prayer that you have spoken to us, you have spoken to each one of us, and that God will help us, that we will not be the same, but Lord, we, we will walk in obedience to your word. May you help us to, to look with gratitude to all that, Lord, you are, you are doing and you have done for us. Search our hearts, Lord. If there, there may be any way that, Lord, uh, we are not working right with you, uh, any of us, Lord, may you speak to, to, to each of us, Lord. The Lord, we may be in tune with you. We may align to, to your interests, to the interests of Christ, even as we serve you uh, in the body of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. Let's sing that one more time. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. Lord, you are the potter, we are the clay, molders and makers. This is what we pray. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your word, O oh Lord. May we be accepted by faith like Abel in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me request us to rise up as we, before we share the words of the grace, I want to bless you with these words of benediction. May the grace of our merciful God who blessed the work of Abel's hands be upon you. As he looked upon Abel's offering with favor, 
May he look upon the sincerity of your heart. Remember our God examines the depths of our intentions and desires our true devotion. In our fallen nature, may we always seek his forgiveness and strive for righteousness. Go forth in the knowledge of his mercy and grace and may the work of your hands be blessed and acceptable in his sight. Amen. Please turn to somebody and share the words of grace. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you and favor you throughout this week.